Welcome to the Connect Your Health to Life coaching podcast. I'm your host, Seth Lusk. I'm a master certified life coach and published author with a decade long background working in the health, wellness, and fitness industry as a personal trainer, nutrition specialist, and life coach. If you're anything like me or the clients that I work with, then you might be struggling with some confidence issues or struggling with feeling like you're not living your most fulfilling or authentic life. You may be trying to figure out why you have these amazing desires for what your most fulfilling life would look like, but you can't seem to create consistent action in your life to reflect those desires. So join me as we dive in deep on what it means to truly live a fulfilled and authentic life from the inside out. We're going to look from the perspective of an empowered mindset and uncover some of the reasons why you might be what's holding yourself back from living that most fulfilling life. But don't worry, this isn't about blame, guilt, or shame. This is about empowering you to see. I'm going to break through some of the biggest illusions and myths that we've all been taught to believe along the way, and I'm so excited to have you with me on this journey. So my only question for you is, are you ready to start living your most fulfilling life once and for all? Then let's get started, shall we? Hey everyone, welcome back to the podcast. For those of you listening in for the first time, welcome, welcome. You picked um, a really interesting episode to join in on this week. Uh, If this is your first episode joining in, I just want to preface this episode with saying that what we're going to talk about today is kind of more of, I want to call it an advanced topic. It goes a little bit maybe deeper than I would say an introduction level sort of podcast episode on on the topics that I talk about. Um, I touched on this topic a very little bit last week. This podcast episode is going to be a little bit shorter than my usual podcast episode because this is a fairly advanced topic. So we're not going to go, I'm not going to try and explain this whole entire concept to you all in, in one podcast episode because there's so much that goes on inside of this topic. But we're talking about possibility today, um, inspired possibility, which is the name of the podcast episode. And um, yeah, so this is kind of the the realm or the wheelhouse in which life coaching sort of nestles itself up in is about what is possible for humans and what can we create out of that possibility? How can we change that possibility? How can we grow that possibility? And so that's kind of what I want to start talking with you all about today is this idea of possibility and what inspired possibility actually is. So possible, let's start off with defining that word. Possible simply means um, the state or fact of being able to be done or achieved. So when we talk about possibility, we're talking about what is possible. And as I said, as a coach, what I work with people so often on is exploring their beliefs of what is possible for them in their own lives and helping them sort of unlock the places where they've sort of trapped themselves in with those beliefs and showing them that more is actually possible for them if they were to explore those beliefs a little bit deeper, dig a little bit deeper past them, start creating some new thoughts, new beliefs, and therefore new behaviors and uh, and change their life from the inside out. So that's what I'm talking about when I talk about possibility. Here's what's interesting here, though. When we talk about what is possible, oftentimes people begin talking or thinking in a way as it's as if they're stating facts. And by facts, what I mean is that people speak or think in ways as if what they're saying or thinking is 100% objective, that it's just true. It is what it is. Um, and or they'll say something or think something like that's just how life is. There is this belief that that nothing else could be other than what they are saying or believing for them is possible. And and a lot of people approach possibility from this perspective. If you remember in last week's episode, though, and I'm only going to touch on this inst- instantly here, so if you if you didn't listen to last week's episode, then I recommend going back and having a listen, and then maybe coming back and listening to this, because I touched on this last week when I talked about comparison, and how we can begin using comparison in a way that is positive in our life, and actually helps us to create more possibility for ourselves in our own lives. And I know some of you, when I said that, might have been confused because you've been taught to think that what is possible just is. It is how it is. That's how life is. There is no changing that. So how can we create possibility, you're asking? 
And that is what this week's episode is about. I want to talk with you all about this concept of what is possible for ourselves and creating possibility and what inspired possibility is. So because I mention this so often, I I wanted to, to have this episode today and have the time to talk about it directly. I talk about possibility all of the time. And what I want for you all to to kind of be left with at the end of this episode is an idea of how we can start to take this internal process of creating, or not responsibility, possibility for ourselves into an active process that we take out into our lives and also apply as we view other people in life around us achieving results that we might maybe feel inspired by, intrigued by, blown away by, or maybe we even feel jealous of or envious of or disgusted by or maybe inadequate when we look at it. I want to teach you all how to turn this into an empowered process of creating possibility for you. So a little bit of a brush up on last week to put this week into context. Last week, I, I talked with you all about the subjectivity of the human experience and how that works as far as how it is nearly impossible for a human to be 100% objective in their experience or their interpretation of life. And by nearly, I mean it is impossible. Um, and that's not, I'm not trying to say this to like diminish your ex- anyone's experience or to create feelings of hopelessness. I'm going to show you how we turn this into something that is empowering. So basically, I can summarize and clarify this and why this is in saying this right here. And I talked about it last week. So again, go back and listen to last week's episode and come back here if you didn't listen. So at any moment in time, there are billions upon billions upon billions upon billions upon billions. And I could keep saying that for probably the next five minutes and not even touch the number of pieces of information that are available to be experienced in what is the reality of life. Okay, those are available to be experienced, interpreted, and to understand life around us. We're talking billions upon billions upon billions upon billions upon billions, keep going and going and going of pieces of information, okay? Now, our body is capable of taking in about 11 million pieces of stimulus at any moment in time, so each stimulus is a piece of information to be sent to the brain for interpretation and to decide on on an experience of it. The brain is then going to go through a series of strategies to eliminate even more data and bring it down to a capable processing speed, which the, the conscious brain is able to process at, which is about 40 to 60 pieces of information at any moment in time. You might be asking, why is this important? Okay, so why this is important to understand is this. Our experience, we call it reality, but it's not actually reality. If we were to take the pieces of information, I'm talking the billions upon billions upon billions upon billions upon billions upon billions and keep going and keep going of pieces of information. If we were to take those and narrow them down to just 1 billion pieces of information, which is already, I need you to understand, eliminating an almost non-comprehensible massive amount of information. So just in narrowing it down to 1 billion pieces of information, we are already eliminating a massive amount of information. But if we did that, say we narrow it down to being just 1 billion pieces of information that are available for us to interpret at any moment in time, then the amount of information that we actually consciously experience, interpret, and form conscious memories of, and therefore thoughts and beliefs about when we talk about what is true in our objective reality. Okay, so what we actually take out of that to create this is about 0.0000000004% of that objective reality. Okay, let that sink in there. And this 0.0000004% is actually only, it's that amount, if we narrow down the objective reality to 1 billion pieces of information at any moment in time. So that right there, that 0.0000000004% is already so minute, but it's actually even less than that that we interpret and that we experience and that we use to form our thoughts and beliefs about life. What this means, my friends, is that our experience and interpretation of reality is so 
finite, and so subjective. We are making interpretations of reality with way less than even 1% of the information that is available that is the truth of reality. We are doing that at all moments and time with our brain. Our brain is capable of doing this and then also creating that sense of certainty and security that this amount of information that we are interpreting is enough to go on for us to get out there in this world and create and do things. And in doing so, in recognizing this, I want you to recognize, I'm not saying this because I want you to feel scared or to diminish the human experience. I want you to recognize this because we have an opportunity to see such an empowering thing here, to recognize something so empowering. If we are only experiencing and interpreting and then creating our reality of what is possible for us from less than 0.0000000004% of actual reality, then guess what happens? We get to free ourselves from a lot of self-imposed limits that we place on ourselves. We get to open up curiosity to what is actually possible for us instead of seeing our current beliefs of what is possible as being this hard stop barrier for us. We can see that our beliefs are merely us reacting to the brain's biological design to create fear and desire certainty to keep us safe and alive. And that reality is something so vast and huge. And then get excited about what could actually be possible for us if we make it a regular practice to go to the edge of our limiting beliefs and start to get curious and question and explore. We also get to take the pressure off of ourselves to get things 100% correct when we get out there and we explore what is possible and try new things. In a hundred years, what we try now, even if we prove it to be true, it will be disproven anyways. What was proven to be true a hundred years ago is being disproven now anyways. Or at least being shown to only be partially true and newer information is uncovered by following the generations who who came before us, and building upon what we have been taught to experience as being what is possible for humanity. So we can take the pressure off of ourselves here. My friends, so many of us stop or limit ourselves from trying things that we want to explore, from asking questions, from dreaming, from planning, from learning, from curiously exploring life and what could be possible for us, and trying new things because of this fear of needing to quote-unquote get it right. And then on top of that, we have the fear of judgment if we don't get it right. So here, my friends, is your opportunity to see the release valve of that pressure of needing to get it right and fearing that judgment if if you don't. Because here's the thing. The most esteemed scientists in this world, doctors, psychologists, professors, thought leaders, world teachers, politicians, presidents, leaders of countries... Guess what? None of them are getting it right, objectively speaking. And yet, they are out there exploring, learning, leading, teaching, trying, putting themselves out there for the world to watch as they explore what is possible for us and pushing the boundaries of what is socially accepted as being possible for us. These people that you look up to as being smart, that you should just maybe give up because you'll never be as smart as them, or you should hide and play it safe and leave it to them to get it right. Guess what? They are all getting it wrong all of the time, and that's beautiful. None of them have all of the facts. None of them knows the objective truth. What they are doing is exploring life with courageous curiosity. They are growing, evolving, and expanding curiously the vast objective reality with such finite ability to experience it and then showing up in the world purposefully on display for the rest of us to learn what is possible for us as humans and that what is thought to be possible is constantly expanding 
as we explore, experience, interpret, and then communicate more and more pieces of the quote-unquote objective reality between one another. So my friends, you have the release valve right here. I'm showing it to you. Take the pressure off. You don't have to worry about getting it 100% right. Explore. Be curious. The people that you think are getting it 100% right aren't getting it right anyways. Neither will you. That's not the point. The point of exploring what is possible, the point of going after what is possible, is not objective rightness because you will never get that. You won't. So here is the release valve of that pressure. I'm showing you where it is. Grab the handle and release it, my friends, okay? So going back to our topic for this week, what is possible for us individually, my friends? How often do you take time in your life to pause? And just look at your story of your experience of life. How often do you do that? How often do you play through that story with the knowledge that it is flawed, incomplete, and rooted in a lot of beliefs that came from flawed, incomplete beliefs of people you were surrounded by as a child while formulating your views of the world, and therefore beliefs of what is possible for you. How are your actions, or how were the actions that you took, and therefore the evidence you created for yourself about what is possible for you, how were those and are those being influenced by beliefs of other people in your life that maybe as a child you believed knew everything or had the answers to life, or you just listened and followed through with your actions as if what they said and taught to you was just objectively true. I'm talking about, think of parents, teachers, priests, pastors, grandparents, aunts and uncles, adults on television, politicians, etc. I mean, anyone, any influencer that you were in front of as a child, or even as a teenager, even now as an adult, how often are the actions that you take based in what you think is possible for you being influenced by those people because you believe they have the answers and you don't? How often do you stop and think about that? How often do you stop and think about this story that you have of life and what is possible for you and play through it with the awareness of how limited, flawed, biased, and subjective that story is? And that's not to diminish that story. That is not to diminish that story. That is your story and your human experience. But here's what I want you to recognize in seeing just how limited, flawed, biased, and subjective it is, is that it is your story. You wrote it, and you get to rewrite it as many times as you want to in this life. It's not objectively true. It feels true for you, based on what you have decided to think and believe about life. But where did those thoughts and those beliefs come from? What inspired them? Where did those people that inspire those thoughts and beliefs in you get their inspiration from? Have you ever checked the limits of those beliefs and those thoughts? And ever questioned... What if there's more? How often do you take that awareness to empower yourself to curiously explore the boundaries of the story that you have written and accepted for yourself as what is possible for you to see that there might be more? Again, this is not about throwing out everything that humans have taught in life or have learned in life or the humans think we know about life. This is not telling you take everything you know and throw it out the window. It's not saying take everything that we have socially agreed upon to make community, communication, society, culture, etc., to make those things possible. I'm not telling you to throw those things out. But here's what we can do. With the awareness that we have in seeing just how subjective our experience of life is, with that awareness, while we accept that these things feel true for us, and we act in them as if we believe in their truth, What we can do is ask ourselves, how often do we take the time to allow ourselves that cognitive dissonance? And if you don't know what cognitive dissonance is, it's the ability to hold two ideas in your head at the same time that seem to compete with each other, seem to have differing or maybe contradict each other. It's that ability to hold space for those both of those beliefs to exist in your brain. The belief that what I do right now is what I want to believe is true, and I will act as if it is true. It is my truth. And at the same time to recognize it's not true. 
How often do we take the time to allow ourselves to see and hold that cognitive dissonance? To exist within our minds that knowing that this truth is not objectively true, but I still want to believe it's true for now, but I can also explore the boundaries of it at any time that I believe that what I want is on the other side of a boundary that I have placed for myself, that I'm saying I cannot pass. What this is about is about seeing that the truth that we hold is merely subjectively accepted as truth. And this isn't bad, but it offers us a lot of empowerment. And because it is subjectively accepted as truth, it is therefore also subject to healthy, respectful, curious, creative, genuine questioning and exploration. The type of questioning that can find holes in the facade of this truth. And as I said, we can do so in a respectful manner. It's not like we have to disrespect and diminish everyone before us who discovered something subjectively true that we're currently living in that we're now questioning and wondering whether or not there's more there. Or maybe if the way that we are, going to, we are going to act in this truth is going to be different because we recognize that more information to this truth and so we recognize the falseness of how we've been acting in that truth. Remember that new truths and possibilities are always being uncovered by those willing to explore. They always have been and they always will be. So new truths and possibilities that you uncover will also be questioned later as well, which is why I'm saying take the pressure off. They need to be questioned later. You don't have to get it 100% right. Your job is not to do that. Your job is to question, find new truth, and put it out there for other people to look at, take in, and question, and find more truth. We have to let go of this idea of, of failure, of not being good enough, not being intelligent enough, not being right, so therefore being wrong when we question something, come to a truth that is later disproven, or later proven to only be part of the truth. We have to let go of this idea that that is somehow bad or failed. That is the objective of human learning. That is the objective of the connected human experience, is for us to all be willing to get out there and be the badass, curious, questioning beings that we are that push the boundaries of what we believe right now to be possible, even though we're living within them. Can we question them, push them further for the next generation, for the next person to take on and push and question further? We get this idea that when we want to prove something to be true, that it just has to like stick and never be proven wrong. That we need to find those unquestionable truths to be something worthy of, of exploring and putting our truth out there. And the truth is, putting our flawed truth out there is the best thing that we can do for humanity to allow others to explore that flawed truth and show more people what is possible when we push past the boundaries of that truth. So when we take the approach of questioning with compassion and genuine curiosity. And we go about this in a line of questioning that is meant for expanding the truth, not for diminishing the truth that already is there, the quote-unquote truth, but expanding upon it. In the process, certain ways that we've been applying the truth will begin to look a little bit absurd to us. That's okay. We don't diminish that truth. We don't judge that truth as being bad or wrong or the people that discovered it or believed in it as being bad or wrong. We recognize their humanity. We have compassion and we build. That's what we are here for. We have the ability as humans to look at the social, the economic, the political, spiritual, educational structure, structures of communication, and to do so with the awareness that none of it is actually objectively factual. And we can question it in a way that opens the doors for more opportunity to exist for all of humanity. This brings me to the second part of what I want to talk about here. We just talked about what it means to use curiosity here, to cultivate a mindset of living that allows us the freedom to create new possibility for ourselves here internally. And in doing so, we create possibility for others. You ever wonder how we create that possibility for others? This is what I'm calling inspired possibility. Because, and I touched on this a, a little bit a week ago, 
When we do stuff where we question what is socially accepted as being true, and we, we take action that courageously goes beyond those boundaries, and we do something that was never before thought possible, other people are watching us and comparing. Comparing what they're doing with their life with what we are doing with our life. And I touched on this last week when we talked about comparison. You see, when we compare, we notice similarities, but we also notice dissimilarities. In the dissimilarities, we have a really cool opportunity. But oftentimes, when we view dissimilarities, at least I know for me in the past, and and still sometimes, and most of the people that I know and my clients, we have this tendency when we view these dissimilarities to take that noticing and go through the action or go down the slope of placing judgments of good or bad, right or wrong, better or worse, etc. We can go down the list of, of comparison judgments here. And we place those upon these observations of dissimilarities. And in doing so, we, we may create feelings like jealousy, disgust, resentment, hopelessness, unworthiness, inadequacy, so forth and so on. But in doing this, we miss out on a huge opportunity here. You see, when we release the judgment aspect of comparison, we can actually create another feeling within ourselves. And that creates something else really wonderful. The feeling I'm talking about is inspiration. And what inspiration can create is a path through which courageous curiosity can create brand new possibility that is authentic for everyone feeling the inspiration and observing the action that they feel inspired by. This is what I call inspired possibility. We have the new possibility that we can create by questioning ourselves and our beliefs and the sources of those beliefs. But we have those moments of opportunity where we see someone else doing something, something incredible, something that defies the social norm, something maybe audacious, something unheard of, something that is... I don't know, maybe even considered a bit absurd, something once thought impossible. And we have the opportunity in this moment to hit the pause button when we observe this, recognize the brain's desire to slip down that slope of comparison judgment. We choose to press pause, and in that moment of pattern disruption, we have the opportunity to choose the path of inspiration. How do we do this, though? Well, the truth is, for each person, it's going to be a little bit different. I help people as a coach to find their own way of disrupting this pattern and moving into curious inspiration, and I do so through a series of authentic and genuine questions for them that that help them to discover their path to inspiration. So a series of questions can be helpful. When we when we notice ourselves seeing this this desire to go into judgment, and we know when we go into judgment, if we allow ourselves to just dip our toe in it, we'll, we'll notice maybe some jealousy, some resentment, some disgust kind of coming up, bubbling up inside of us, the, the emotion, when we notice the dissimilarities in someone else's behavior or appearance. And what we can do is ask, what am I actually observing here? This is what we first want to do. How can I make what I am observing, observing here feel completely neutral for me? How can I word it in a way that is completely neutral for me? I'm talking no loaded emotional language. Let me give you an example here in in my own life. Okay. So, and I'm not saying this has actually happened, but in my life, I'm a singer. I love to sing. So say I'm observing someone singing a song and I'm hearing this person hitting notes in a way that I don't think I've ever heard someone hit notes before. Now, I can make that mean a lot of different things. I can say that in a way that has a lot of different emotional loadings, either in a positive or a negative way. I could be like, oh, God, that's so annoying. They're hitting all these high notes, and why can't they just sing like a normal person? Or I could be like, oh, my God, they're hitting these high notes. That's so incredible. I can't believe a person can do this. I can add all this emotional loading language. But if I bring it back to just stripping it down to being completely neutral, I can say I am observing someone singing a song right now. And I'm hearing them hitting notes in a way that I don't think I've ever heard someone hit those notes before. And once I have this way to say it, in a way where I'm observing it in a neutral way, I can then go back and I can compare it to how I was wanting to describe it with emotions. What what emotions was I creating within myself with the judgmental description? What did I want to create those emotions in my description 
of this observation? Why did I want to create those emotions? So was it for protection from something? Something that I didn't want to feel. So going back to the previous example, maybe my judgmental observation would include a description like, ugh, listen to this person singing and look at all those high notes that they're hitting. It's so ridiculous. Why can't they just sing like a normal person? Why do they have to be such a show off? Blah, 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 blah. I could, I could say that's my judgmental observation. So when I, when I say that observation, I create feelings within myself. And if I look at those feelings, maybe I create feelings of resentment, disgust. Maybe then I ask myself, why, why am I creating those feelings? Am I trying to hide from something else? Am I trying to hide from another feeling? Maybe I'm creating feelings of resentment and disgust because I'm trying to hide from the feeling of jealousy that I don't want to feel. Because if I feel jealous, I also feel like I'm not good enough. So now I'm getting to a source of these feelings. I'm feeling not good enough. And therefore, I'm wanting to make judgments about this person singing in a way that I feel like it's going to make me feel good enough or better than them. But remember, when we do comparison and we try and do better than worse than, what we're actually doing is just creating more conditional worth upon ourselves so we don't feel better in the end. We just feel like we have more that we have to prove. We have to work even harder to prove our worth because now we have to be better than this person to be good enough. And then when we're better than them, if someone else is quote-unquote better than us, we have to be better than them. And so we create this slippery slope of conditional worth upon ourselves. So maybe that's why, because I feel like I'm not good enough, that's why I'm making these judgments about this person that's singing in a way that I believe defies what's possible and normal for singing. Once I recognize this, I can see that jealousy stems from me not giving myself that unconditional worth and value for exactly who I am and for what talents I have and my ability to sharpen and strengthen them at any time I want to. But even if I don't, I'm still 100% worthy and good enough just as I am just as I'm showing up, just as I'm expressing myself. So we go back to that space of unconditional worthiness. And from there, once we're able to do this, once we've explored through the feelings that we're wanting to create with the judgments and why we're wanting to create those feelings and what we're trying to hide from, then we can go back from that space of seeing that we were putting conditions on our own worth. We can go back to that space of unconditional worthiness. And then from there, we can reapproach the neutral observation. This person is singing notes higher in a way that I do not think I've ever heard a person do before. And then I can ask myself, is there a quality there that I wish to own in myself? Here is where I find a lot of people getting confused. Because many people would say, oh yeah, well, they're singing higher notes. That's the quality. Okay, I could say that, but maybe my voice does not biologically get that high. You know, I am a human being. My vocal cords are biologically designed to be a certain length, and I can strengthen them, strengthen them, but maybe they won't ever get to the point that I can hit notes as high as this person does. Maybe their vocal cords are a little bit shorter than mine, genetically speaking. I can train and see how high it goes. Maybe I can go higher, but maybe it does not ever get as high as this other person person's voice goes. So the tendency there would be for people to be like, see, I'm not as good of a singer. But remember, we're coming from a space of unconditional worth. So the highness of my voice does not make me more or less worthy, a, a good or a better or worse singer. That's not the point here. And so many people, when asked to do this exercise, will jump straight into an action that a person can do or something that they did or something that they bought or something that they own. And these I want you all to recognize that when you look at these as being the quality that you wish you own in yourself, what you're doing is looking at containers of expression. These things are containers of expression. In our example here, the high voice, the high notes, for instance, is a container of expression for this person that is singing high. And I am observing that container. What is it expressing? That is the question we want to get to here. And here is what is so interesting about this, because how I answer that question may not be what they are actually trying to express. That's what's so cool about it. So how I answer that question will be a reflection of what I desire to express in my own life. And therefore, how when I am observing them doing this behavior, I see it being played out in this person's actions. That characteristic. In this case, the high singing. Maybe for the person that I am observing... For them, they're doing these high notes as an act of expressing freedom because freedom is important for them. But I'm observing them, and when I observe them singing in this way, I see an expression of power. Maybe that's what I see. I see an expression of power. So I have my answer here. I see an expression of power in this person. 
I was wanting to feel jealous of this. Maybe because I don't feel like I'm expressing power as much as I want to be. Maybe I'm limiting myself in the ways that I believe I can express power more fully in my own life because that's important for me. Maybe I'm hiding in some ways in my life where I have an opportunity to express more power, maybe in the way that I sing. So in our example as a singer, say I train. I find the limit of my voice as far as the range of notes. It's not as high as theirs. So is it over there? They're just objectively a better singer than me? No, we talked about that earlier. It's not about that. That would be the tendency that most people want to take this route of thinking. But I want to make this about inspiration and possibility, remember. That's what this is about. And in this path, we don't have conditions on worth. We don't take the the judgment slope of comparison. So we don't take the judgment of someone being a better singer and, and make that be like a falsely objective truth. So what inspired me in this person's singing was that I recognized a reflection of my desire to express more power in my own life. And I don't yet, or maybe won't ever in my life, have the vocal range that this person has to express power through hitting notes that high. Maybe I won't ever have that. But that's not what's important. Because is pitch of note the only way that I can express power? In singing, we can just talk about singing here. There are so many other ways we can apply this. So obviously, power can be expressed in so many ways in life. But we'll just stick with singing. The answer is no. There's also volume. There's clarity. There's control. There's vibrato. There's tone. So many ways that I can express power. The music that I put behind me. The words that I use in my singing to express power. And the thing is, what I am admiring in this person is how much I see the expression of power. And what's crazy is they're not even expressing power. They're expressing freedom. But I see expression of power because power is what's important for me and my subjective experience. And that is what I'm valuing. That's what I am observing through this person's expression. So I can bring it back to me and my own way of expressing what is important for me, in this case, power. And this brings me to a line of questioning where I get to look at my own skills as a singer and honestly ask myself, are there areas in my singing where I believe I have limits in how I can express power through my music, through my words, through my voice? And then I can ask myself, what are those limits? Where did I get the idea that those are my limits from? Where did I get that idea? Was it from something someone said to me or someone, someone else heard that I, or that I heard them saying to someone else? Was it something that I observed in someone else, you know, maybe attempting to express power and not getting the result they want, and then I'm like, oh, see, that's what happens when you do that, and then I judge them, and so therefore I put a condition on my own worth and my ability to explore an expression of power there because I'm afraid of my own judgment of myself if I explore and get a different result. Where did that belief come from? I ask myself this. Why do I accept that belief or those beliefs to be true? Do I have to? Is there a way that I can explore the boundaries of these beliefs with some curiosity to find where maybe there's a flaw? Maybe there's a space to look through and find more possibility that lies on the other side. Maybe I find that I had a belief that I could only hold a note for a certain amount of time. But what if I explored that belief? I mean, holding a note for a certain amount of time is about having enough breath support, right? It's about having enough air. What if I worked on my breathing a bit more? What if I started doing certain types of exercises to increase my ability to breathe deeper and support my breath better with my diaphragm? What if I found a way to sustain that note just a little bit longer than expected? Longer than maybe even anyone else has sustained that note. Is that a possibility for me? Is that a way that I can express more power in my voice? And I get curiosity working. I get to work using the tool of curiosity, getting excited about exploring new possibility in an area of my life where maybe I felt like this is just how it is. And in in this exploration, I open the door for new possibility. I also open my mindset up to creating evidence that what I believe is true is subjective and what I believe limits me is subjective and might not actually have to be true for me. I create evidence that I can explore and find more possibility. And this, my friends, is inspired possibility. It is the ability to take what we observe in other people when we feel immediately inspired or even when we feel jealous, envious, disgusted, resentful, inadequate, whatever the feeling is. 
when we learn how to take that feeling, bring it back to ourselves through our lens of unconditional worth, and we look at our genuine values, wants, true desires for this life and our mission, and we're able to find where we are being called to explore new possibilities in our own path. That, my friends, is inspired possibility. The essentials for being able to do this are first to be aware and have the tools of emotional responsibility, to have the awareness that your experience is extremely subjective. You'll also want a clear vision of your values, your sensitivities, your truest desires in life, which you're not going to see if you're filling yourself up on false desires. Talked about that in previous episodes before. And a clear vision of your mission in life. You'll want that too. You will want a clear awareness of your unconditional worth and practice in being able to bring yourself back to that space of knowing that worth, even when old wounds are triggered that bring up thoughts of conditions on your worth. Being able to go back to that space of unconditional worth is so important here because that's the space where we can genuinely feel inspired possibility from. And one of the last skills and tools you will want to have practice here is the ability to cultivate that curious, courageous exploration of your thoughts and beliefs through powerful, compassionate questioning of those thoughts and beliefs. And you have to have that awareness that your thoughts and beliefs are subjective first. Not to diminish them, not to judge them as being bad, but that they are not everything that there is to know. My friends, anyone on this planet has the ability to learn these tools and to practice them, which means that anyone on this planet is able to create new possibility for themselves and find inspired possibility in life through observing other people. I'm keeping this episode a bit short here today. It is intentional. Today, I want for you to I want for you to take away inspiration. It's not a how-to guide. I want you to take away awareness and inspiration that you have so much power, so much more power than you're letting yourself recognize to really, really change your reality of what is possible for you. I want you to begin to notice that today and let yourself feel excited about it, okay? That's what I want you to take from today. And when you feel ready to follow that excitement, guess what? I'm here. Plenty of other coaches are out there. I'm here to help, either as your coach or as someone who can point you in the direction of another coach or a program or a path. I am here to help. I got into coaching to help people change their lives and realize that what they believe is possible for them is subjective, and what is truly possible for them is up to them. So I'm here, and what I hope is that today's episode brought you some exciting awareness and inspiration. That's all I have for you today, my friends. I love you all. I enjoyed sharing this with every single one of you. I wish every one of you to find your path into exploring new possibility, both internally and through external inspiration. So get out there. Get out there and explore. And until we meet here next week, my friends, ciao. Hey, thank you for listening in this week. I hope you enjoyed the content of this episode. If you did, please subscribe or follow this podcast to receive the newest episodes every week as I bring them to you here on the Connect Your Health to Life coaching channel. Ratings, reviews, and comments are always appreciated. These allow me to know more of what my listeners would like in the podcast and allow for more people who may be searching for a podcast just like this one to find the Connect Your Health to Life coaching channel. If you would like more information about me and the work that I do with my clients one-on-one, then please visit my website at www.slch.ch. Again, that is www.slch.ch. You can also find me on social media on Instagram at sethlusk underscore coaching. Again, that is sethlusk underscore coaching. And on Facebook in my free Facebook group community called A Healthy Life Connection. We would love to have you in the group, and it's only three membership questions that you have to answer to join. And again, it's entirely free. And if you need any further information or just want to say hello, feel free to send me an email directly at slusk.health at slch.ch. Again, that is slusk.health at slch.ch. Thank you again so much for listening. 
and I look forward to our next time together. Ciao.